So is there any worry that Alexa could cannibalize the D21 market? Well, I'm, I'm sure there was some concern early on, but the experience that we've had is that since we announced the Alexa, the use of D21s has gone up. Wow. Um, there's been a couple more features that decided to shoot D21. We've actually sold a couple of D21s since we announced Alexa. Um, the, the main reason for people preferring the D21, they ha it has a 4.3 imager, so it can do anamorphic and it has an optical viewfinder. So there are actually people who want to do projects where they shoot with the Alexa for the, the light challenged images and the high contrast images and the D21, which is a little bit slower in terms of sensitivity and also can do anamorphic. So I, I think there's a good mix and match between them. I, I, my guess is eventually people will stop using the D21 and just use Alexa. Can you tell me a little bit about the upgrade capabilities of this camera. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people are worried about making a big investment in a camera. Uh, I'm sure rental houses are. Uh, and then, you know, a few years later, what do you do? Where, they, where will they be? The announcement that we made about the upgrade path for Alexa is already starting to come true. We uh, initially announced uh, two versions of the EV camera, the EV and the EV Plus. The difference between the EV and the EV Plus is that the Plus has a different side panel on it. So those customers that bought uh, early Alexas, the early adopters of the Alexa EV that want to upgrade to a Plus, um, sometime probably September, early October, you'll be able to pay the upgrade price, which we're, we haven't determined yet, but it's somewhere around $20,000 US. And you'll take this panel off, there's four screws you take off and a couple of ribbon connectors, and you put the new panel on, and now you have a Plus. It also means swapping out the lens mount uh, for a, a lens mount that has data in it. And what the Plus will give you is it will give you wireless control of iris focus and zoom. Along the panel here, there's connectors, so it's all built into the camera, and there's a little Wi-Fi antenna so that you can control the iris focus and zoom motors from within the camera and a wireless controller. The other thing is the, um, the DTE module, which is the direct-to-edit where you put the ProRes cards for, for capturing QuickTime files. And it's the same thing here. You can take four screws, remove this, and as newer media, larger capacity media, different form factor media, or other codecs become available, you take this off and you replace the panel. So we've got on the front of the camera, we can swap out or upgrade the lens mounts. On the, on the operator side, the, um, the DTE module. And on the other side of the camera, the Plus. And those are the ones that have already been announced. In terms of the, the firmware and software inside the camera, it's very open in terms of feature set. So the initial feature set, when we get caught up and we get all that software out, there'll be a, a bunch of additional features coming, a lot having to do with wireless control of the camera and interface wirelessly with the camera. Great. Tell me a little bit about the recording options on, on Alexa. Yeah, I would say one of the biggest ground-shaking announcements about the Alexa, and we held off until right before NAB because of our licensing issues with Apple, is the ability to take uh, the Sony S by S cards and put them into the camera and record um, at 444, we can record 15 minutes of material, and at 422, we can record uh, 20 minutes of material on a single card. So you can have two cards, so you can record a half hour of 444. The camera has the ability to span between them so that you can continuously hot swap cards. And then what you end up with uh, on the card is you end up with MOV files, which are QuickTime playable in any uh, PC or Mac, that are ProRes encoded. And ProRes is the native uh, codec for Final Cut Pro. So the files literally drop onto the timeline and you start editing. And at NAB, Avid announced support for ProRes in Media Composer 5. So in Media Composer 5, you can take these cards, take the media, and drop it right onto the timeline. So that's the direct to edit record option in the camera. And I think it's one of the more compelling options. But the camera doesn't require you to do anything um, it allows you, it gives you options. So we also have on the, on the other side of the camera, we have the uh, video outs. So we have what are called our rec outs that can be configured as two single link HDSDI or a dual link HDSDI, or we'll be able to support 3G, which is dual link over a single connector, or what's called quad link, which is four HDSDI signals. And you need those signals to do things like um, 60p, 444 at very high frame rate, high bandwidth. We also can take out of these same two connectors, we can take what we call T-Link, which is the data interface that we use for Airy Raw, which is to take the raw sensor data and record it onto um, hard drive recorders like the Codex or the S2 or the KG that's uh, in Japan. And additionally, you could configure the monitor out 
clean without any of the monitor uh, information, and you could use that as, a, as an additional recording option. Wow. So, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's pretty revolutionary that you can shoot ProRes 444 and start editing right away. Yeah, and the other nice thing about it is that all of the outputs are turned on all, the, all at the same time. So you could record Airy Raw and ProRes at the same time, or uncompressed HD and ProRes, or let's say you wanted to put a P2 recorder on and record ProRes. All of the metadata and all of the information that's inside the camera goes out all the outputs at the same time. So there's several different workflow configurations that people could use. So for shooting, doing offline on ProRes, whether it's 422, 444, whatever, uh, and then conforming all your metadata is going to match. Yeah. You don't have to worry yeah, about Yeah, we use a unique file naming convention so that we're able to match back the stuff that's recorded in raw or uncompressed. Fantastic. Could you just expand a little bit about uh, ProRes 444? Uh, obviously, it's a Apple's highest uh, quality codec. Mm -hmm. um, but is it good enough for broadcast? Is it good enough for feature films? I mean, where does it, where does it all kind of break down? Well. We, we support all of the ProRes codecs from the proxy all the way up to the 444. The two most compelling are the 220 megabit 422 codec, which um, it's a 10-bit codec, and I would say it's, it's probably OK for television applications. The 444 codec is a 330 megabit, and it's a 12-bit uh, codec. So in terms of the quality of record, if you're using our log C, which is a, the gamma curve that we use, it's like a Cineon film scan and you record 444 ProRes, the result that you end up with that I've seen in some of the grading houses that I've been in the last few months um, is that it's equal, visually equal to HDCAM SR and uncompressed video. It's very difficult to make a distinction. So the 444 stuff for uh, television applications and for um, lower budget independent features I think is a slam dunk. Wow, that's exciting stuff. Michael, can you spell out the workflow for me? I mean, you know, uh, we're shooting a film, all of a sudden we hear it's on Alexa. Um, what's, like, what, what's a typical workflow, would you say? Well, we have, we have a couple of, I would say, standard workflows, although it's, it's expandable in a bunch of different directions. But the, the typical workflow for uh, a simple system where you're going to be shooting ProRes and you're going to be editing ProRes and then you're going to be finishing is you'd shoot onto the cards. You take the cards into a laptop or use a card reader to go into a desktop computer. Um, they, the, the images drop right onto the timeline, so you do all of your editorial, and then you take that material. You can sync your sound also at the same time. We have the ability to take audio into the camera, so if you don't want to use a second uh, sound system, but if you did, you'd sync your sound, and then you take it into color correction and color it. But you can have, a, you can have a scratch track from yeah, the, from you the have, camera. Yeah, we have the ability to input two two channels of uh, audio that are digitized and are embedded into the ProRes and in, into the uh, HDSDI. So that would be probably the simplest workflow. And then um, a little more, uh, I would say the feature workflow would be to use um, an Airy Raw recorder or an uncompressed recorder and, and use that as your original camera negative and then use the ProRes files as your offline. So you take those images, you'd take them into your offline, you'd make all your editorial decisions and then you'd reconfigure the system to capture the Airy Raw, just the takes that you're going to use, and then link the list that you've built together, and then take that through color correction and finish. Is there any requirements for a plugin for Final Cut or for Avid? To handle Airy Raw, we have uh, there's about 14, 13 or 14 companies now that we've been partnering with. We've been doing Airy Raw for about five years with the D20, so there's several different tools that are available in post production for for reading the files, for playing them back. We offer a free um, piece of software called Airy Raw Converter that lets you convert to DPX, and DPX files can be read by Final Cut, by Photoshop, by pretty much anything. And then there's Great, so if I, need to get my, uh, if I need to get a shot DPX files over to my VFX house? No problem, no problem. You can actually, in Final Cut now, you can do a conversion from, um, from ProRes to DPX. Great. In, in color, actually. But there's a couple of other tools. There's a company called Palmfort that makes a program called Silverstack. We're um, fully supported by Baselight. We're fully supported by um, uh, Assimilate, the scratch system. They, they can handle the ProRes and the Airy Raw at the same time on the same timeline. Um, uh, we, have a, we have several companies who are writing uh, uh, debayering algorithms to take the Airy Raw and then to decode it 
in uh, NVIDIA has what's called CUDA, which is a GPU that's in the video card. So right. relatively inexpensive video cards now have the ability with our SDK to write a routine to do debayering. So you, you'll see a lot more tools coming out. Wow. But right now, most of the tools that are used in Hollywood for post-production coloring will support um, Airy Raw. Great.